So John chapter 1, verses 19 to chapter 2, verse 2. So, now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who'd been sent questioned him, why then do you baptise if you are not the Messiah or Elijah nor the prophet? I baptise with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. All this happened at Bethany on the side of the Jordan where John was baptising. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptising with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptise with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down on and remain is the one who will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples and when he saw Jesus passing by he said, Look, the Lamb of God. Then the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was, the one, of, uh, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We found the one who Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nazareth? How can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you a while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angel of God descending, ascending and descending on the Son of Man. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Jesus 
it's always interesting sitting down the front here and then I, I come up here and all these other people who weren't here before, they've arrived, which is great. So it's good to see you all. <clears throat> Let me pray. Father, thank you for this, these amazing words that you have preserved for us all these years. Thank you that we can read about you being revealed, uh, being shown to people. Thank you that we can come and see you as well this morning. We pray that we might hear, be listening to you, be hearing you, and be wanting to obey you. Amen. <clears throat> so my little granddaughter, come and see, come and see, Grandpa. Juliet had just made something with her Duplo, and she wanted me to come and have a look. You know what the grandkids are like, come and have a look, come and have a look. It wasn't a fantastic building, but it was, it was good, so I made the appropriate, ooh, oh, ah, that's, that's great, Juliet, that's fantastic. The key thing is she wanted me to come and see what she'd made. Didn't matter what it was, she wanted me to, to go. There was, there was no hesitation in inviting me to her creation, to look at her creation. Well, today we get introduced to a number of people and the focus is that they're all saying to others, come and see Jesus, come and see. God has revealed himself. Come and see this revelation of God. Remember last week, the focus was on the fact that God had revealed himself in the flesh, in Jesus, the word of God and the son of God. This week, it's a passage where people are testifying or witnessing to, to Jesus being there. They're, they're like a bunch of eyewitnesses to who Jesus is. Before we get into it, I should just clarify, I'm, I'm not sure whether some, some, some people may have been a bit confused. There's, there's two Johns here, aren't there? So um, the, there's the one, one John who's the disciple of Jesus and who's the writer of this book. He's different to John the Baptist, who's the one who's mainly been talked about. So when you, when you actually see the word John mentioned, the name John mentioned, it's normally John the Baptist. Uh, John doesn't normally refer to himself. We'll have a look at a part where, where I think he actually comes into the story later on. Now, another interesting thing is, and I've never really noticed this before, if you remember last week, um, after John's intro to those first 18 verses, and we, we had those words, in the beginning, sort of to introduce it, well, in, the, in this section that we've looked at today, it's like John is talking about seven days. Ah, that's interesting. I've seen that somewhere before. In the beginning, God created, and he created the world in seven days. And so it's, it's almost as if he's kind of doing, um, sort of, mi not mimicking, but sort of copying what's happened in the, in, uh, in the beginning of the, the first book of the Bible. And John's telling us the events of the first five days. There's actually nothing on the sixth day. And then the seventh day, that's why I included chapter two, which has the mention of the, uh, the wedding, because that's really the seventh day. So there's the seven days, these things that are happening there. Now, whereas in Genesis, God is creating a new world, a new earth, from nothing, here people are pointing to Jesus and saying, this is the one who God has sent to reveal God to us. In fact, he's the Lamb of God. He is the one who is going to sacrifice to take away our sin, sacrifice himself. And there are three individuals who we're going to look at this morning who are testifying to Jesus in these verses. So let's have a look at them. The first one is John the Baptist. Now we've already got, had a bit of an intro to him last week in verse 6, 7 and 15. And John witnesses to Jesus being the light, the one who is greater than himself. Um, here he's confronted by a group of Jewish leaders comprising priests and Levites and Pharisees. Now whenever you see in John's Gospel you see this word the Jews or Jewish leaders, 99% of the time they're opposed to him or they're trying to catch him out or they're, they're, they're certainly not his mates. Um, and, it occurs, and this phrase occurs a lot in, in the Gospels. And it's, it's interesting because you remember back in verse 10 and 11, um, John, John mentions, he says, there are those people who didn't, who uh, Jesus, God, 
the word came to his own people, but they did not recognise him and they didn't receive him. Well, here's really the first example of that, these guys. So let's follow the story from verse 19. The Jews asked John the Baptist who he is. Is he the Messiah? No. Is he Elijah? No. Is he the prophet, the one mentioned in Deuteronomy 18? No. Now they know that there's something special about this guy. He's a righteous man. He's, he's not doing this to, you know, to, to make a lot of money. In fact, he doesn't make any money at all. He's just eating, um, what is he eating? locusts and uh, honey. But he's not, he's not doing things like he's, like he's supposed to. His dad was a priest. So normally you'd expect him to follow in his dad's footsteps and be a priest as well. But he's not acting like a priest. He's doing all this baptising stuff and calling people to repent, just like an Old Testament prophet. Notice how they're really asking all the wrong questions. That They're asking, you know, who are you? Whereas their question should have been, what are you here for? What, what do we need to do? What are you saying to us? Verse 23, John tells them what he's, what he's here for. And he quotes from Isaiah 40. I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Now at that point, there should have been a response from these Jews like, tell us please, what, you know, what do we need to do? How, how are you making the Lord's way straight? What, what, are you, what are you doing? What's God telling you? But no, their question is, why are you baptising? You know, it's sort of like, who gave you the authority to do this? They don't want to learn to change their ways. They, I think they figure they've got God worked out. And this guy, John, is not fitting in with the ways that God does things in their thinking. And now we see something very significant in the way that John answers them. John doesn't say, actually, why he baptises. He goes straight on to, saying to, to telling them about Jesus. He's, his job is pointing them to Jesus. He's not really interested in talking about himself. He's come to reveal the word, the light, the lamb to those around him. John is absolutely set on pointing people to Jesus. It doesn't concern him what they think of him personally. John doesn't want to answer questions about baptism or about himself. He's come to bear witness to Jesus. That's who he wants them to look at. And again, <clears throat> I, I love the way in which um, John, in verse, he quotes verse, uh, 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 Isaiah 40 in verse 23, and there's that thought in there that he's just a voice. He's a voice pointing to Jesus. He doesn't come as a, as a, as a great teacher or as a rabbi. Um, basically, he just he told people to repent, and that was pretty much the, um, the long and short of his, his teaching. But he's also saying to them, you must get ready. And this idea of the road... If, if there was a king that was coming to visit your town, you would make sure that the road leading to your town was fixed up. You know, no potholes and all that sort of stuff. So he's saying, get ready for the king. Prepare the road, which is your hearts. Prepare your hearts for this king coming. So back to his answer to the Jews. Yes, I baptise with water, says John, but there's someone else coming after me who is far greater than me. I can't, even untie <coughs> I can't even untie the straps on his sandals. He just goes back to Jesus. I want you to know about the person whose sandals I can't even untie. I just love John. He's this guy with a big following. He's got people coming from all over Judea. Like he's not just, you know, just a few people from his hometown. They're coming from everywhere. There's lots and lots of people, people getting baptised, people repenting. He had a big following. It could have easily gone to his head. Hmm, I'm needed here. I'm doing an important job. But no, all he's doing is he's pointing to Jesus. And we'll see later on in chapter 3, he says, I must diminish and Jesus must get bigger. But again, the response of the Pharisees, they don't ask him about Jesus. It should have been, you know, where is he? Take us to him. Tell us more. <laughs> there's there's a, um, a saying that the, the rabbis had uh, at that time, and it was, went like this. 
every service which a slave performs for his master shall a disciple do for his rabbi or his teacher except one thing except the loosing of his sandal ties so in other words do everything that the master asks you just like a, a slave would but there's one thing it's, it's really degrading you don't have to do that's to take off his sandals and probably also washing feet as we all, as we've already heard about that Jesus does later on so John uses this this uh, saying to declare that he's not worthy to perform even that task which only a slave would do the most menial of tasks for the one who is to come John may be sent from God but you Jewish leaders listen in there is one coming who is far far greater than me that's what he's saying come and see him so that's the end of the first day just a little word about John's baptism the thing that made John's baptism kind of strange was that normally in their in their um, in, in their practice normally only non-jews were baptized an Israelite a Jew was never baptized they were already part of God's people they didn't need to be baptized an Israelite um, so, so an Israelite would never be baptized but the Gentiles had to be washed in baptism so if they became a Jew they all the, the men and the women would be baptized and the men would be circumcised as well John was making Israelites do what only Gentiles would do and that included these Pharisees and religious leaders who thought that that they were already clean John was saying that the chosen people had to be clean as well so basically John's saying again the king is coming and for his king for his coming you need to be cleansed as much as any Gentile prepare yourself for the entry into history of the true king and John says that when the chosen one comes he will baptize with more than water he will baptize with the Holy Spirit in verse 33 the Greek word for baptize means to dip or to submerge so it's just dipping or it could be completely going under it can be used of clothes being dipped in dye just sort of putting in a little bit and taking them out it can be used of a ship which is submerged beneath the waves it can be used of a person who is so drunk that he's you could say he's soaked in drink when John says that Jesus will baptize men with the Holy Spirit he means that Jesus can bring God's Spirit to us in such a way that we are saturated and our life and whole being are flooded with that Spirit isn't that a great truth so now verse 29 it's day two John sees Jesus coming towards him are the Jewish leaders still there listening they probably aren't so who's he talking to it's probably just his disciples but we're not actually told but the, here are these remarkable words in verse 29 to 34 John calls Jesus the Lamb of God now none of the other gospel writers Matthew Mark and Luke they don't use this phrase at all this phrase is used later on by some of the, um, the writers and we see it particularly in, in Revelation the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world so what's John referring to there, there's lots of references to lambs in the Old Testament there's the Passover lamb there's um, Isaiah 53 where there's the lamb who was led to the slaughter the, the, the servant would be like that there's the lamb of Genesis 22 when um, Abraham is going to sacrifice his son Isaac and God says no 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 stop that and he gives him a lamb to sacrifice there's the there's the references to the lamb um, in, in Revelation the lamb that was slain but is reigning victorious and I think um, the conclusion for most commentators is that it's it's really not any one particular thought but it's it's sort of like a general allusion to sacrifice the fact is that all those sacrifices in the Old Testament are like a foreshadowing or like a preliminary viewing of the big sacrifice of Jesus he perfectly fulfills all of these sacrifices in his death on the cross and John's given a special revelation here it's it's most likely that those who are listening didn't really understand what he was saying um, they're probably thinking oh the Lamb of God is it the Passover one 
they're probably still sort of scratching their heads exactly. Um, but, but do you notice how Jesus' disciples, they quite often scratch their heads. I mean, Jesus kept on telling them, I'm going to die on the cross in three day, and th- after three days I'll rise again. And they sort of say, oh, yes, 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 yes. Now, now, wh- now where can we sit in your, you know, can we sit on this side or that side? Where are we going to be in your kingdom when you come? And you're the Messiah, remember? They still really didn't get it, even up to the point where he died. So they probably didn't understand exactly about the lamb. But we understand today, don't we? He is the lamb, the one who is sacrificed for us. Okay, day three, verse 35. Again, they see Jesus. And again, there are the words, the lamb of God. And verse 37. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. It's as if John is saying, look, there he is again, the lamb of God. Don't wait with me. Go and follow him. Go and be with him. And so they do. Uh, these two guys, we know one of them was, was Andrew, um, <clears throat> but the other one isn't named. Now, most commentators think that that probably was John who was there. He, may, he was probably a disciple of, of uh, John the Baptist as well. And he records for us that he spends the day with Jesus. And then he records that time, that specific time of the day. And I just wonder whether that was actually the, the, the time where he came to a, an understanding, this really is the Messiah. I'm putting that time in there because I want you to know that was a special day for me. That was a special time. That's the end of that day. So those two guys spend the day with Jesus. Day four, our number two witness, Andrew. He goes and finds his brother Simon. He says to Simon, we've found the Messiah, the Christ. These two words, the Messiah is like the Hebrew version and the Christ is the Greek version of, they both mean the anointed one. And um, the combination of what John the Baptist had told him and spending the day with Jesus had convinced Andrew that this was the, this was the Messiah. Now I'm sure, as I said, he still didn't exactly understand what all that meant. But the thing is, he brought people to Jesus. He brought people to Jesus. Now, I love, what, I love what we read about Andrew in the Gospel. He's only mentioned three times, but the three times he's mentioned, he's bringing people to Jesus. He's bringing people to Jesus. And he's not a really important guy. Notice here in verse 40, how is he referred to? That's Andrew. Oh, Simon Peter's brother, in case you didn't know who Andrew was. Because Simon Peter was the one everyone knew. But what's Andrew doing? His great joy is bringing people to come and see Jesus. And that that really strikes a chord with me and I I hope with you as well. Because, you know, you don't have to be an important person, but all of us can say, come and see Jesus. Come and see Jesus. My neighbours, do you want to come and see Jesus? Do, Do you know about Jesus? Can I tell you a story about Jesus? Can I tell you about what he did on earth? What he said? You don't have to know everything about Jesus. You might only know two or three stories. I've shared with you before, I think, about the the guy in Pakistan 140 years ago. He knew like five or six stories about Jesus, but he knew that Jesus had died on the cross for him. And he went to one village and told his five or six stories. And 30 people became followers of Jesus. And he goes and gets the missionary and says, oh, come and baptise these ones. He goes to the next village and tells his five or six stories. Now, most of us know at least five or six stories. Let's tell others. Let's share the good news that, and let's tell others to come and see Jesus. There's no greater gift to give someone than to introduce them to our Creator. So Simon comes to Jesus and Jesus makes this pronouncement. You are Simon. You will be called the rock. You will be called Peter. Now, we know that Peter was loud and impetuous. We know that he had lots of failings. They they get recorded in the Gospels. But the great thing about this story is that Jesus sees the potential in this guy. He doesn't only see what he's like now, but he sees what he is to become. And I love that, that he sees what Peter would be able to do in the power of the Holy Spirit later on. Jesus looked at Peter not not just as a simple Galilean fisherman, but one on whom he was going to build the church. 
And Jesus sees us not only as we are, but as we can be. And he says, give your life to me and I will make you what you have it in you to be. We're now up to the fifth day and our third witness, Jesus decides to leave for Galilee. This time he goes and finds Philip. Now this is interesting because um, he, he actually goes to Philip and he calls him to follow him. Maybe Philip was too shy to come to Jesus. We don't really know. So Jesus comes and gets him. Philip is possibly also a disciple of John. Um, it's interesting, <clears throat> one of the commentators reckons that Philip was probably a, a little bit slow. Um, John mentions him a few more times in his gospel and each time he seems to be out of his depth. He doesn't quite know what to do. He seems to be a guy who's maybe a bit limited in his ability. But Jesus goes to find him. <laughs> now, you know, Philip may be a little bit shy and not quite sure if he should approach Jesus, but Jesus knows his heart and he goes to find him. And the fact that Jesus finds him, um, so he's, he's just this ordinary guy, but Jesus goes out of his way to call him. And I just love the fact that Jesus isn't just looking for people who have lots of, you know, sort of out there, lots of ability. He goes and calls the shy Philip to come and follow him. And notice for all that we might think about Philip um, not being very um, sort of outward and stuff, what does he do? He goes and finds Nathaniel. And he tells Nathaniel, we've found the Messiah. We've found the, the, the one of God. Nathaniel <coughs> Nathaniel's saying, Nazareth, you're kidding, mate. <laughs> that little hick town, Nazareth. Could anything good come out of that country village? Well, Philip doesn't argue with him. He's probably not good at arguing. He just says, come and see. Just come and see. I mightn't have all the answers, mate. Just come and see Jesus. And Nathaniel takes up the invitation and his life is never the same again. Now, we don't know much about Nathaniel. Um, he's not, he's, this, this, this is the only time he's mentioned in the Gospels at all. But Jesus says, as he's coming towards him, he says, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit someone who you can absolutely trust, who's totally honest about where he's at. It's the kind of thing that's a couple of times in the Old Testament that same phrase is used. Psalm 32, there's a lovely uh, verse 2. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. It's a wonderful thing to say. This is a person who's truly wanting to follow God, not just doing the right thing, but actually listening to God confessing their sin and following him. So in verse 48, there's this amazing statement. Jesus says, I saw you. He sees Nathanael's heart of desiring God. <clears throat> Hence his comment about being a man of no deceit. And he's sitting under the fig tree. Now that's a, that's a very uh, common phrase that's used about um, Jews. Um, they would often sit in a place like under the fig tree to spend time with God. And presumably he's, he'd just been in prayer with God, he was seeking after God, he was a quiet place, no one else was there. Maybe God had been speaking to him, he'd been praying that the Messiah would be revealed. Now the teacher appears, who he recognises in some way is special and sent from God. Jesus identifies where he's been sitting. And he probably doesn't understand completely, but he knows that this Jesus is a man of God. And it wasn't so much that Jesus had seen him under the fig tree that surprised Nathaniel. It was the fact that Jesus knew what was in his heart. He knew the thoughts of his inmost heart. Nathaniel saying to himself, here is the man who understands my dreams, who knows my prayers, who has seen into my, in, my most intimate and secret longings, longings which I have never even dared put into words. This must be God's promised anointed one and no other. And from that moment, Nathaniel's heart is captured to the man who read and understood and satisfied his heart. As we finish with verse 50 to 51, um, it's actually interesting with Nathaniel, it's the first reference to someone who believes. It talks about Nathaniel believing. And as Jesus talks to him, it's almost, I can almost see Jesus smiling. He says, you think it's... Um, Amazing that I, can, that I knew what you, where you were sitting and you're doing. Mate, 
you're going to see far greater things than these. That was nothing. And then he addresses everyone. He's, he used the, the word you is plural there. So all of you listening, you'll see heavens opened. God is coming down and revealing himself in a new way. And it's like a reference, that this going up and down is a reference to in uh, Genesis 28 where Jacob was uh, um, asleep and God came and uh, gave him a dream. And in that dream, there's this like this, this stairway up to heaven, not the song, stairway to heaven. And here angels are going up and down. Um, and in the, in, uh, so, so this, this ladder of Jacob's dream, God, uh, Jesus takes this image and says that now I am here, there is communication directly from heaven to earth. Now Jesus is come and he is communicating what God is like. We are seeing God revealed. Jesus isn't just a fulfiller of prophecy, he's actually the revealer of God, the means of establishing communication between earth and heaven. So it's like Jesus is saying, Nathaniel, I can do far more than read your heart. I can be for you and for all men that way, that ladder that leads to heaven. It's through Jesus and Jesus alone that we can, in a sense, climb the ladder which helps us to know God. All of God is now revealed in Jesus. Just finishing, in this chapter, there's a, you notice there's a whole lot of titles. It is, if you go through and underline all the titles, the Word, the Light of Men, the True Light, the One and Only Son from the Father, are greater than John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, the, Lamb, the Lord, the Lamb of God, the One who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, God's Chosen One, the Son of God, Rabbi, the Messiah, He of whom Mer Moses and the prophets wrote, the King of Israel, just about every title that's going to be used later on is there in chapter 1. How does Jesus refer to himself in that last verse, 51? Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. Probably the most lowly of the titles. <laughs> the seventh day is in chapter 2, three days later, which really means two days. You think of um, you know, Jesus uh, rose again after three days because they sort of count... Friday when he died is the first day, then Saturday is the second day, is the third day. So it's, it's sort of that way. The seventh day is the wedding feast. And that finishes off the first week recorded by John. And that's where we're finishing today. Now the next two weeks, um, we, we'll be having a break from John. Emma's coming next week. And then the week after, a, a guy called Elliot is coming here from Grace Point Presbyterian Church. He's a first year student at... Um, at uh, Christ College so it's great that he's coming to to share with us so he's practicing a little bit with you know preaching but I think we'll be blessed as he preaches to us from Philippians 4 so um, but in the in uh, so this week will in your in your groups you'll be looking at the second half of chapter 1 but next the next week when Emma after Emma's preach we go, I'm gonna give you some questions and things to think about with chapter 2 because I'm then gonna go on to chapter 3 on June the 30th, okay? And we'll pick it up at chapter 3. Let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Messiah, King of everything. Thank you that you have revealed yourself and come in the flesh. May we be faithful witnesses of you to those around us. May we encourage others to come and see Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.